God is good. And all the time. Let's try that again. God is good. And all the time. A blessed Sabbath to all of you. I am delighted to be with you. I'm actually privileged to be with you today on this holy day, which God made, blessed, sanctified, and never changed. Can you say amen? amen. So we're happy to be in God's presence on this day. Uh, on the fourth day, God made the sun, and we can feel it. And uh, so that tells you immediately the sermon will not be long. I can feel the effects of the sun, but I thank God for it. We need it. The sun is the foundation of life. Who is visiting with us? May I see your right hand or any hand you choose. You're visiting, just raise your hand if you know you're a visitor. Any visitors? You're not from Mount Pleasant? Just raise your hand. Ah, there you are finally. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Second call. If you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you're visiting with us, raise your right hand. All right. God bless you. I see a hand over there. Anyone else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you're visiting with us. We're happy to have you. And may God bless you. Our subject for today, the light of the world. What did I say? Amen. The light of the world. Very serious subject. I want to get right into it. But before I do, I have three favors I must ask you. Favor number one, please turn off all your cell phones. Uh, off, not down, off. Not on vibrate, off. If you put it on vibrate and it vibrates, when you look to see who's calling, the person next to you will look to see what you're looking at. That's the way human beings are. And there will be a ripple of disturbance in the presence of a holy God. And you know you cannot do that in a courtroom. Because the judge will slap you into prison. So let us respect the judge of the whole earth. Are you with me? All tell cell phones turned off, not down. Number two, pray for me while I'm speaking. And all I want you to say is, Lord... Put your words in that man's mouth. And that is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. It's also based on 2 Samuel 23 verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Now that is specific. That's where I want God's words. And favor number three, I want you to think. As you listen, are we ready to pray? Let's bow our heads. Loving Father in heaven, I need your help, and I need it urgently. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ to speak through me. Grant me simple words, direct words, powerful words, words that are life and words that are spirit. I humble myself before you, day God, seeking not my glory, but yours. Touch every listening heart, I pray. And when those listen, whether by internet or on radio, wherever this is rebroadcast, convict their hearts as well, I ask. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. We pray in Jesus' name that all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1, our subject is the light of the world. I'll tell you some things today you may find difficult to believe if you're Seventh-day Adventist, and doubly difficult if you're not. But that's the nature of truth sometimes. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? The Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Genesis 1, 1 to 5. Let's go over that passage, make some observations that may have escaped us at the first reading. Because most people read the Bible in a very shallow way. They do not concentrate. And by not concentrating, we miss some gems of truth. Let's pick it up from verse 3. Well, from verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. Now read with me the next few words. And 
darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Bible says there was darkness all over the world. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. What is the relation of light to darkness? We haven't got all day. They are opposites. Whoever said that, God bless you. Light and darkness are opposites. We are introduced to a pair of opposites. Favor number three, think. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Here we have the first commentary from God in the Bible. His commentary is, light is good. Since the Bible is a book of opposites, if light is good, read my mind and finish my statement. Darkness is not. Please don't sleep. He causes people to be sleepy, I know that. If you think you'll sleep, stand up and listen to the sermon standing. <laughs> now that's not funny because the Israelites were told to eat the Passover meal in what position? Standing. So it's not so strange to listen standing. You're more alert when you stand. But don't worry, I want to ask all of you to stand. The Bible says, and God saw the light, that it was good. He made no comment about the darkness. We know from Genesis 1, verse 3 and 4, light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Here we learn something else about God. God is a God who divides. He separates. Are you with me? God does not want light and darkness to coexist. In the book, Child Guidance, page 45, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes these words. The whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. Since you missed it, let me say it again. The whole natural world is designed when you think of design, what state of mind comes to your mind? If someone designs something, the person is acting how? The word begins with a D, also has an E, just like design. When you design something, you're acting how? D-E-L-I-B-E, -E. come on, you're Zimbabweans, you're intelligent. Come on, what word am I spelling? <laughs> Deliberately. Now, in other words, it's no accident. Listen to the quotation again. Child Guidance, page 45, paragraph 3. The whole natural world is designed. God deliberately made the world in such a way that there are spiritual lessons. In the same book, Child Guidance, page 46, paragraph 3. In the natural world, God has placed in the hands of the children of men the key to unlock the treasure house of his word. The unseen is illustrated by the seen. Divine wisdom, eternal truth, infinite grace are understood by the things that God has made. Many of us never understand the deep things of the Bible because we don't go to nature to get help. Divine wisdom, eternal truth, Infinite grace are understood by the things that God has made. Now, taking the principle that the natural world has spiritual lessons, we can understand why Jesus did all his teachings using what? Parables, yes. Because it was he, as creator, that put lessons in the natural world. That means, let me just digress, hopefully profitably, as we go about our business from day to day, wherever we look, we see the natural world. We should be wondering, what is the spiritual lesson in grass? What is the spiritual lesson in a bird that flies? 
If we would do that, we would think of God all day long. Instead of two seconds before we fall asleep, when we say, now I lay me down to sleep. And two and a half seconds when we get up before we rush off to work. Let me say it again. When you understand that God placed spiritual lessons in this physical world, you and I have the possibility, the opportunity to think of God all day long. Now, let's take the principle and go back to Genesis 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God, as I said before, does not want light and darkness coexisting. And he built that into creation when he divided light from dark. If that's clear, say amen. Amen. Now, that was God's arrangement before sin. Or if that's the way it was before sin, you can imagine how necessary it is after sin. Are you with me? Amen. If Sabbath keeping was required before sin, you can imagine how vital it is after sin. Light and darkness. In Matthew 5, verse 14... Jesus speaks these very familiar words. Ye are the what? The light of the world. What is our subject? Light of the world. Now think with me. The Bible is a book of opposites. And if you apply that principle, the Bible will come to light. Much more than it probably has for you. Listen to the verse again. Ye are the light of the world. Now if you are the light of the world, it means the world has what? And it needs what? And who has the light? Ye, whoever ye is. And we'll identify who ye is today. Because those who were light 2,000 years ago are dead. But the word of God endures for how long? Forever. So there must be a light of the world today. Because the Bible teaches the world is only getting worse and worse. And the worse it gets, the darker it gets. And the darker it gets, the more bright the light must be. Ah, you missed it. You're sleeping with your eyes open, you missed it. Let me say it again. Ye are the light of the world. When Christ said that, who was the target of those words? Let's go to verse 1 of Matthew 5. Our subject is the light of the world. It's uh, 20 minutes to 12, I think. 20 minutes to something. You have Matthew 5, reading verse 1. The Bible says, And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was sent, his disciples came unto him. Pause. Let's examine those two verses. How many groups have we mentioned in that passage? Name them. The other group? Disciples. <clears throat> two. Let's read it again, then we'll add verse uh, 3 or 2, whatever it is. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Who is them? The disciples. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, that message is not for an unbeliever. Let me say that again. If any man will slap thee on, smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other, that's not for an unbeliever. It's not even for some so-called believers. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. That's not for an unbeliever. That is the lifestyle of a believer. Jesus spoke to the disciples, ye are the light of the world. Amen. Let's go to Genesis 12 and look at the father of all believers. Who is that? Come on, speak loudly. Who is that? Abraham. Abraham, the father of the faithful. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Always remember that. 
Yes, he's the God of Adam too, but the Bible describes God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He begins with Abraham for a reason. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1. And I'm reading from the King James Version, which is my favorite version, by the way. So when you come, if you have that version, bring it. So we don't sound like the Tower of Babel, everyone saying something different. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be, what? A blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee, finish the verse, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Let us look at that passage closely using favor number three, which is what? Think. The Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. That is the classic call of God to the sinner. Now that call is serious. There are many people who cannot give up certain cultural tidbits, even if it conflicts with the word of God. You didn't hear what I said. Abraham was called to leave his culture, his country, his nuclear family. Because when God calls you, you've got to get up, leave everything, and go. Amen. You may not have to leave it physically, you've got to leave it in your heart. Many of us, we have one hand in God's hand, so we think, the other hand in the past life. And that's a proper way to go to hell. Get thee out of thy country. We're all proud of our country. You're proud to be Zimbabweans. I'm a Zimbabwean. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Oh yes, I am. I'm a son of Mzilikazi. <laughs> yeah, yes, I am. Lobengul is my great-grandfather. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. We love our family members, our specific clan within a tribe. So you may be from the Kumalo tribe, if you're, are you with me? That's the royal tribe. Hmm? And from thy father's house. Unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And make thy name great. And thou shall be a blessing. When God called Abraham... Were there other nations around? Did God promise to make them great? No. Come on, talk to me with confidence even if you're wrong. Did God promise to make them great? No. no. God said, I'll make you great. And in verse 3 he says, I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee. God has two responses. He either blesses or he curses. He does not have a middle ground. Are you awake? Amen. <laughs> Let me say it again. God either blesses or he curses. He either saves or he destroys. He either justifies or he condemns. You're either his child or you're the devil's child. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Finish that verse with me. Genesis 12, 3. And in... Why do you answer so weakly? Read with me. And in shall of the earth be... At the end of verse 3 of Genesis 12, in what we just read, how many groups are identified? Four. I said at the end of the verse. 
Name the four. Name the four. You said four. Oh, all. Oh, your four sounds like all. All right. Listen to the end of the verse again. I will, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How many groups are mentioned? Two. Identify them. Thee and the rest of the world. Let me say that again. God splits the world into two groups. Abraham and his family and everybody else. And who would be the source of the blessing? Abraham and his family, not the rest of the world. Now, Abraham would be a blessing to the rest of the world. But God bypassed the rest of the world and gave that privilege to Abraham. Let me repeat my words. God bypassed. It wasn't accidental, it was deliberate. Because after the fiasco at the Tower of Babel, and they scattered, and God looked down looking for faithful people, he found one family. Abraham's family. Amen. Mm -hmm. Son of Abraham. <laughs> one family. And God said, Abraham, come. And God told Abraham, through you, I will bless the whole world. So I don't want to give you the impression that God hates the rest of the world. But God called a special group of people. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. And the rest of the world were dependent on them. Read verse 4 with me. In him was life. And the light was the life of man. Light is life. Amen. John 8 verse 12. Reading the red letters of Christ. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Finish that verse. But shall have what? The light of life. Light is life. Light is something else. Psalm 119 verse 104. Psalm 119 verse 104. Our subject is the light of the world. You know this verse very well. Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Light represents God's word. Stay in Psalm 119, read verse 130. Psalm 119, reading verse 130. Do you have that? Who has it? If you have it, read it. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Light is life, and light is the word. But let us combine those two things. Let's go to John chapter 6, reading verse 63. John 6, verse 63. This is Christ speaking. John 6, 63. Do you have it? It is the spirit that quickeneth. What is quickeneth? What does that mean? To quicken is to give life. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Life is light. Light is the word. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Now, if the word is light and the light is the word, then when God says ye are the light of the world, what God means is you have a word which is life and the world needs. You missed it. You missed it. Let me say it again. Let me say it by taking you back. Don't go back there physically, but just listen. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. And what happened? What does that tell you about God's word? It has power. Listen to Genesis 1 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so God spoke and the animals came. What does that tell you about God's word? To give what? Life. Life. 
Psalm 148, verses 1, 2, and 5. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. Let me tell you something about the angels. The angels were not made from dirt. God just said angels come. And angels appeared. Ah, uh, you're not listening. Amen. Did you have such so this morning? You're just not listening. What did I just say? How were angels made? Just the word. Psalm 104 and 48 verse 5. He commanded and they were created. That is by the word. Are you listening to me? Amen. This has life. Amen. Because this is truth. You're following me? Amen. Now, Jesus told the disciples, you are the light. You have the truth that the world needs to live. You'll have to convince me that you're following me. Because I'm not convinced at all. I don't want to be discouraged in this pulpit. No preacher should be discouraged. He has God with him. But man, sometimes you come close to discouragement when people are not following you. Now I want you to refute what I just said and tell me you're following me. I'm trying to pick a fight on the Sabbath. Are you following me? Jesus said to the disciples what? This side. What did he say? Matthew 5, 14. What did he say? Ye are the light. What is light? Life. How did God create the world? The word. The word is light. The word is life. Jesus tells the disciples, you have a word of life that the world needs. Now let me ask you this. When Jesus said that, were there other religions in the world? Yes or no? Yes. What was Christ then assuming about them? That whatever it was they taught, what was it? Darkness. Ah. <laughs> Not listening. Listen to me. There's one source of light. And Christ said it's in the disciples. And the world needs it. But that's 2,000 years ago. And the world needs light today. We've got to identify. <laughs> Who has that light now? Because the world needs it. Revelation 12, reading from verse 1. Last book of the Bible, you should find that easily. Revelation 12, reading from verse 1. You have that? I'll finish shortly. I usually say that five times before I finish. <laughs> Revelation 12, reading from verse 1. Do you have that? Answer me. Yes. All right. Amen. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman, what? Clothed of the sun. Keep reading with me. And the moon under her feet. Come on, I can't hear you. And upon her head, finish it, a crown of 12 stars. Now there's another woman in Revelation 17. And a woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked in gold, precious stones, and pearls. Revelation 17, 4. Let's focus on Revelation 12, 1 and 2, that woman. Let's rehearse how she is described. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Let's go to Genesis 1. We read from verse 14 quickly. We go from Revelation to Genesis. That's how you study the Bible, you see. Here a little, there a little. When you study like that, you will end up knowing the truth. Amen. But if you pick one isolated verse and build a church on it, when the rains descend, the floods come and the winds blew, that church will fall. 
Revelation, uh, Genesis 1, 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. We have the greater light, the sun, the lesser light, the what? The moon and the stars. Now, one of the reasons for their creation was to give light. Amen. But we've said the whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. So spiritually, that light represents what? Life. Ah, oh, come on, you slow. <laughs> Let's go back to the physical. Do we need the sun physically for life on this earth? Yes or no? Yes. Now, what's the spiritual application? Light is life. Now, listen to how the woman is dressed. Behold, a woman clothed with the sun. What does the sun give? Oh, Come on, what does the sun give? Life. The moon under her feet. What does the moon give? Life. And upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. What do the stars give? Life. What is she covered with? Life. Light from where? Ah, got you. <laughs> ah. Light from where? Now to understand where her light comes from, let's go look at the other woman. Revelation 17 verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked in what? Gold gone, precious stones and pearls. I can hear the tears is turning. Revelation is the last book. You can't have such difficulty finding it. Do you have it now? Revelation 74, read with me. Read with gusto. This side, read Revelation 7 and 4, King James Version. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with what? Gold, go on, precious stones and pearls. Having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of a fornication. Now, answer me all of you now. Does gold shine, yes or no? Yes. You live right next to South Africa. That's where all the gold comes from. Gold shines. Do pearls shine? Yes. Do precious stones shine? Yes. So does she have a kind of light? Yes. Now, where does gold come from? The ground. The earth. Where do precious stones come from? The earth. Where do the pearls come from? The earth. Where does her light come from? The earth. But the woman in Revelation 12, she's illuminated by what? The sun. Where's the sun? Where's the moon? Where are the stars? Where's her light from? Heaven. Now, there's a true light and there's a false light. John chapter 1 verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. If the Bible says the true light, if you use the rule of opposites, what is the Bible suggesting? There's a false light. Sunday worship is false light. Amen. Having more than one wife is false light. Amen. Come on, say amen more loudly. Amen. Yes, sir. I know your customs. <laughs> but you can't prove it from the Bible. And Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every custom. Oh, every word. There's a true light. There's a false light. This woman, her light is not any creation of hers. Are you with me? Yes. None of her doctrines she formed. Yes. She got them from heaven. Amen. Now, read verse 17 of Revelation 12. Let's identify the light for the least last days. Revelation 12, 17, the Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, how many women did we talk about? Two. Two. With whom is he angry? The one in 12, yes. not the one in 17. Yes. All those who are with me say amen. amen. Ah, that's an improvement. <laughs> Let me say it again. And the dragon was wroth with the woman of Revelation 12. Yes. Now we need to identify her, her line, her genealogical line that extends to this day. Are you with me? And went to make war. What's the purpose of war? Yes. To destroy. Yes. Destroy. Yes. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Yes. Now, 
We have three groups of people in that passage. Let's identify them. Who are they? We have, well, before you get to the remnant, you have to have a, a prior group. We have the woman. Are you with me? Then her seed. Then the remnant. Do you follow that progression? I don't believe you. Let me tell you again. We have the woman. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Then her seed. Are you with me? Amen. Then the remnant. Why is the remnant last? Because remnant means the last piece left. Now, seed extends down through the ages. Remnant means towards the end of the age. The last few left. How do we identify them that inherit the light from this woman? Which keep the commandments of God. Amen. <laughs> the Bible says there will be a group of people in the last days who have a theological connection that goes all the way back to that woman. Because if we have seed and remnant, a mango seed planted produces what? Amen. Then produces mangoes, and the seeds fall, produce mango trees. What we have is an unbroken line of heavenly truth Amen. from that woman yeah. until now. Amen. And the single identifying mark is that the remnant of that woman, they keep the commandments of God. Amen. Now, some people think the devil hates all churches. Wrong. The devil's best friends are churches. Are you listening to me? If you study prophecy, Satan first began with an empire to destroy the Christians. What was the name of the empire? The Roman Empire. And persecution broke, broke out. But the more they were persecuted, what happened? the more they grew. So the devil said, this persecution thing is not working. And he came up with a master stroke. He said, I will no longer use a political empire. I will use a religious organization. A church to destroy a church. Because a church does not expect a church to destroy a church. Are you with me? And so in Revelation 7 and 6, the Bible says, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Why was John wondering about this woman? Because John had lived through persecution. John was seeing a church persecuting the church. And so he said, how can this happen? Listen to me carefully. The devil's most powerful weapons today are churches, not governments. Because we know from prophecy, churches will tell governments what to do. Ah, come on. What's wrong with this side? That's how the mark of the beast will be passed or will be developed. That's how the Sunday law will pass. The churches will tell the governments what to do. Did Pilate want to let Jesus Christ go, yes or no? Did Pilate want to let Christ go, yes or no? Yes. What did the church say? No. Crucify him. The church told the state what to do. Amen. And the state did it. <laughs> Listen to me. The Bible identifies a group of people. That makes the devil nervous. And the devil hates them. And the chief mark of these people, they keep the commandments of God. How many commandments does God have? They keep ten, not nine. You see, if you keep nine, the commandments can't help you. Thoughts from the mind of blessing, page 52, paragraph 1. The servant of the Lord writes, In obedience to God's law, man is surrounded as with a hedge and kept from evil. evil. Amen. He who breaks this divinely erected barrier 
at one point has destroyed its power to protect him. Let me put it this way. Let's say there's a lion in a cage. The cage has bars and there's the lion. There are 10 bars. The lion can't get out. How many bars do you need to remove for the lion to get out? One. Are you with me? One and you're dead. That's why the Bible says when you break one, you break all. Because the power to protect is gone. Now, let's use the law of opposites. Revelation 12, 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if the devil hates a church that obeys God's commandments, how does he feel about churches that don't? He likes them. He likes them. Did I do that? That's the devil. He does not like what I'm saying. Are you with me? Listen to me again. The devil hates any organization that obeys God's commandments. And he has no problem with those that don't. And so the revelation does not record the devil made war with the woman of Revelation 17 described as a whore. Because she is his woman. Every man needs a woman. And Satan has one. But every God needs a woman. And Jesus has one. Are you with me? And they keep the commandments of God. That's the devil again. All disturbances, that's the devil. Not God. God wants you to hear what I'm saying. The light of the world. In our last day events, page 43, paragraph 3, we read these words. God has a distinct people. A church on earth. Second to none. But superior to all. In their abilities to teach truth and to vindicate the law of God. He has a people. Second to none. Superior to all. In their ability or facilities to teach the truth. Amen. Has God no living church? He has a church. But it is the church militant. Not the church triumphant. Meaning we're God's people. But we have people who belong to Satan. Oh yes. How many disciples did Jesus have? How many were devils? Wow. Name him. Jesus. And Jesus said that. John chapter 6 verse 70. Jesus said, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. Amen. All devils are the same. The only difference is the difference in, 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 of the intensity of the devilment. But all devils are the same. It's like a little piece of an apple and a big piece. Chemically no different. Are you with me? Jesus had a devil in his church. How many devils are at Mount Pleasant? Don't tell me. <laughs> My friends, let me close. Do you understand what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist? Hmm? Theologically. What do I mean by theologically? What did I tell you last night? None of you were here last night. If I use a word you don't understand, say, explain that preacher. Theology means the study of God, study of the Bible. So theologically, with respect to the truth, there is a group of people that have a historical connection to the pure original church of the New Testament. Amen. And the Bible identifies them as those who keep the commandments of God. But even in that original church, there was a devil. And so when you look for a church, you don't look for a church where everyone is perfect. You look for a church that preaches truth. Not that has perfect people because you'll never find it. 
Heaven had problems. God made perfect angels. Somehow Lucifer produced himself. Became Satan. Christ shows the disciples one was the devil. And sold him out. You look for truth, not for the quality of life of the members. God has a people on this earth. And they're called Seventh-day Adventists. And they keep the commandments of God when most of the world does not. And cannot prove from the Bible why they do. Let me tell you something. The world needs what we have. Now they don't know that. We have to let them know that. They need the light that we have. Amen. Because the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Amen. And this is the will of God, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. That's God's will. And sanctification is only through truth. And there's no truth in believing that when you die, you go straight to heaven. That can't sanctify you. It's not biblical. There is no truth in believing you go to witch doctors to find out God's will for your life. That's not truth. There is no truth in Sunday's a holy day. That's not truth. Only truth sanctifies. Amen. And all of us want to be saved and sanctified as people love to say. And I'm saying to you today, do you obey God's commandments? Can it be said of you who keep the commandments of God who have that light that the world needs? So when Jesus said, "Ye are the light of the world 2,000 years ago, he was thinking of us as well. Because in John 17 verse 9, the Bible says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Are you with me? Then in verse 20 of Genesis 17, uh, uh, Matthew 17, he says, Neither I pray I for these only, but for them also which shall believe on their word, on me through their word. Jesus says, I'm praying for these men and for those thousands of years down the road who accept what they say, because what they say is what I gave them. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. So Christ prayed for these people, the light of the world. In 2012. When you understand that's who you are. Why do you want to be somebody else? Are you with me? Amen. The Israelites were called by God to be special. And they wanted to be like the other nations. So they said give us a king. Samuel said why? So that we may be also like the other nations. Is there a worse insult to God? Than to call you to help others. And you choose to be like the ones you're supposed to help. My brothers and sisters, I want you to make a commitment today. That you will recommit your life to being the light of the world. Amen. Are you with me? It is the highest privilege God can bestow on you and me to make us a part of that group that he designates as the light of the world. Because if you're not the light, what are you? Darkness. And if light is life, what's darkness? Yes. I'm asking God right now, help me in all that I do in the pulpit and away from it to live with the consciousness and to conduct myself with the awareness that I am part of that group called the light of the world Amen. and I want God to so empower me and enable me that I will carry out that sacred serious function that through my work my life many people will be called to Jesus Christ Amen. And may have that eternal life which he offers freely on the basis of his sacrifice. Amen. Because if I'm not leading people to Christ, I'm leading them to Satan. Amen. You didn't hear me. You didn't want to hear me. Amen. Let me tell you again. If you're not pointing someone to Christ, you're pointing that person to hell. Amen. I'll say differently. No one can go to heaven without a star in the crowd, meaning without having saved somebody. 
Everyone who goes to hell will take somebody with him. Because God made us to have influence. And the only control you and I have over influence is the quality of the influence. You can't stop yourself from having influence. God made us that way. And so I recommit my life to God. To be faithful to this commission he's given me. To be the light of the world. How many of you will say, Father, thank you for this message. Give me the power, give me the strength, so I may live as someone who understands that I have been called to be the light of the world. If that's your commitment, may I see your right hand, please stand with me, stand with me. Let's pray, I'll let you go. We come back this afternoon at uh, 6 o'clock, I believe, or 5. We're standing to say, Father, help me to live up to the high calling. And that calling is to be the light of the world. In the classroom when I sit next to my friends who are not believers. On the workplace where my colleagues who are not believers. On the playground, wherever I am, I am light. I am life. That's my first consideration. And I will avoid any behavior, any speech, any conduct, any personal expression that gets in the way of my being light. And I will avoid the greatest insult to God. And that is to be like the darkness that God has called me to be a light to. Jesus says the blind cannot lead the blind. They both end up in the ditch. And if God calls you to be light, and you're trying to behave like those in darkness, you and they will end up in the ditch. <clears throat> Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for this tremendous privilege of being called by you to be the light of the world. The true light, the light of everyone that cometh into the world. Forgive us, dear God, for wanting to be like the world. Forgive us for wanting to live like those in darkness. Just being blind like the blind, both of us falling into the ditch. But Father, today we recommit ourselves to being that light as you have called us, that through our lives, by everything we do, others may be drawn to Christ. Please, dear God, forgive us for our unfaithfulness and give us strength to serve you faithfully. That when Christ comes, thousands will be ready to meet him because we had become the light of the world and were faithful to that calling. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Ramu